And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Revelation of Jesus Christ. Thirteen, we have been looking at the beast that rose up out of the sea. You remember it was right after the dragon in chapter 12 and all that he said, and then we find the dragon standing on the sand of the sea, and uh, this beast rises out of the sea. And we saw last time the beast is established by Satan. He sponsors the beast, give, gives him his strength and his authority. And we also saw that one king or kingdom appeared to die and be healed. I saw, verse 3, one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. And that brings us to chapter 13, verse 4, where the whole earth worships the dragon and the beast. They worship the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? So this uh, appearance of resurrection by the beast causes great wonder all over the world, and the whole world worships the beast and the dragon. This has been Satan's goal all along. He wanted to be like God, remember, when he first fell. That was his goal. This is the only place which explicitly says that he is worshipped at any time. So he finally reaches his goal for the last three and a half years. Must be disappointing to him, don't you think? To just have three and a half years. They want to know who is like the beast. You know, that's the question that God directed concerning himself. He reminded us to think, who is like God? What other God would be like him? Isaiah 40, 18 says, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? And of course, the implication is there is no comparison. There is no one to liken to God. Isaiah 40, 25, To whom then will you liken me, that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. Well, no one equal. And then this was prophesied concerning the man of lawlessness in Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. The man of lawlessness would take his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And here in this 13th chapter, we have the beast, who is the man of lawlessness, who is the Antichrist, and he is going to display himself as God, and the whole world is going to worship him. You know, it's quite a remarkable achievement when you think about it. I think that it is the work of Satan to make multitudes of different religions. There are so many different varieties all over the world, and it's uh, kind of like throwing out flack to, to deceive and to misdirect. But in this time, Satan doesn't want to deceive and misdirect. He wants to deceive in a different way. But he doesn't want to get rid of 
uh, of religion. He wants to be the religion. He wants to be the one who is worshipped. And so uh, this is what he is gaining for this time. And the question they ask is, who is able to wage war? Who is able? The people of the world are going to look at this Antichrist and they're going to see his capabilities, and their question is going to be, who could possibly war with him? And you think today, you look around the world and you say, well, there's this power that could attack, and this power, and there are these things that could happen, but it's going to come a time when the people of the whole world say, there's nobody that could attack him. We might as well get aboard the successful thing. Go with the, the flow, go with the winner. And so they're all going to be worshiping the beast. Who is able to wage war? Well, there will be some answers as we go along. The final one is in Revelation chapter 19. And you've got a pretty good idea of what the final answer is. Who can wage war with the beast? But religion is still going strong. The world's united. Many religions are placed with one. And uh, there are still Christians on the earth, and they are being faithful to the Lord. And they're following him. And Jesus is going to talk about that in a little bit here. In verse 5, let's see, I was going to stand right here, but that doesn't work out too well, does it? <laughs> that was on purpose, Aldi. I knew what I was doing. <laughs> The whole earth worships, and the beast blasphemes. And that's what we have in verse 5. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Who would give the beast a mouth to speak blasphemies? Would that be God giving that to him? No, wouldn't be God given that to him. It has to be Satan, the dragon. And Satan has the authority, he claimed the authority when he was talking to Jesus at Jesus' temptation. And he has the authority and he can give it. He wanted to give it to Jesus under certain conditions. But now he has this beast and he's going to give this authority to speak blasphemies, arrogant words and blasphemies. The and between arrogant words and blasphemies is the Greek chi, and sometimes it has the word even. Most of the time it means and, but sometimes it means even, and that's what it means here. Uh, arrogant words, even blasphemies. The arrogant words are blasphemies. That's what he's arrogant about. An authority to continue 42 months. And then you, okay, who has given him authority to continue 42 months? We saw that it would have been Satan who gave him the ability to speak uh, arrogance and blasphemies, this mouth that he had. And uh, you might think, well, maybe it's Satan here also. And it may be. I don't know. Ultimately, who sets the time limit? It's got to be God. And the end of the time will be when Jesus Christ returns. When he returns to set up his kingdom, this beast isn't going to have any authority to do anything any longer. He's just going to be another of the souls in hell. But it may be within the scope of the authority Satan's permitted for a season to give him authority Tack for 42 months. He might even try to deceive him. I'm speculating totally here. He, he, he maybe could try to deceive him and offer him a longer term, but surely Satan knows that's all he gets. He's going to get 42 months, and then he's going to be absolutely done. 42 months begins at the rise of the beast out of the abyss. He comes up out of the abyss. He's got 42 months, and then he will be gone. It'll be all over again. 
And uh, we call this period of time, this 42 months, which has come up quite a few times, sometimes three and a half years, sometimes a time and times and a half a time. It's the same period, but it's expressed in different ways. And what, what, what is this period, this three and a half years? What do we, do we, do we have a name for that? The Great Tribulation, exactly. So the Tribulation is seven years old long, but the Great Tribulation is three and a half years. The Greek scholar A.T. Robertson says that when he opened his mouth in blasphemies, the word opened is aorist, and he calls it a constative aorist. Now we've talked about the aorist, and and sometimes it is past tense, but the most basic thrust of it is that it's a single action as opposed to the present tense, which is a flow of actions. But in this case, the single action is looking at a long period of time and just one action over that period of time. In other words, it's not a flow of action, it's just one. But it's constative, it is constant over a period of time. He opened his mouth in blasphemies against God. And this blaspheming is a characteristic of the beast and the Antichrist. To blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Dwell in heaven is also the word tabernacle. Same word exactly. His tabernacle, even those who tabernacle in heaven. Uh, how would you blaspheme the tabernacle? This is talking about the heavenly tabernacle or the one on the earth? To be the earth? No. No? No. It's the heavenly tabernacle. Okay. And he's going to blaspheme his heavenly tabernacle. But how would you do that? You'd say insulting things. Oh, that shack. Nah, yeah. I would never say that, okay? I'm just giving an illustration of something somebody might do to blaspheme the tabernacle in heaven. And those who tabernacle in heaven. Dwell is masculine or tabernacle is masculine. Now, you don't think of these things as having gender, but in the Greek language they do have gender and the gender has to agree. If this and this are talking about the same thing, they both have to have the same gender. But it doesn't fit, the tabernacle doesn't fit the name and it doesn't fit the tabernacle. The dwell tabernacle doesn't fit in the his tabernacle. So let's go back and look at that. He opened his mouth and blasphemes against God to blaspheme his name. And his name is neuter gender, not masculine gender. And his tabernacle, and his tabernacle is feminine gender. And so, when it speaks of dwelling, masculine, it doesn't fit either one. And so you say, well, what, what's he talking about when he says uh, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Those who dwell in heaven, not the tabernacle, not the name, what would that be? Those who dwell in heaven. Masculine. Saints. Hmm? The saints? Uh, good guess. Good guess. Not right, but good guess. <laughs> Speak of angels? Angels. Sure. Talk about the angels there. He's now why is Satan gonna take pains to blaspheme the angels? They wouldn't follow him. They wouldn't follow him, and as a matter of fact, they joined in throwing him out in the war in which he got thrown out of heaven. So he's angry with the angels and he's blaspheming them while he's at it. He blasphemes of both in claiming to be God and disparaging the true God. He is claiming to be God himself and that's blasphemy. And then in 
saying nasty things about the true God is another form of blasphemy. And this action of the beast reflects Daniel's prophecy. Daniel really prophesied this, and we have it in Daniel 11, beginning with verse 29. Daniel 11, 29 through 35. At the appointed time, he will return and come into the south. But this last time, it will not turn out the way it did before. For ships of Kittim will come against him. Therefore, he will be disheartened and will return and become enraged at the Holy Covenant and take action so he will come back and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. And may I say that to explain that section, we'd have to take a whole different study. So I'm just picking up on these. I like to pick things up in context. And here's what I was really looking for. Verse 31. Forces from him will arise. Desecrate the sanctuary fortress and do away with the regular sacrifice. And they will set up the abomination of desolation. And this is the time we're talking about. It's right in the middle of the tribulation period. And uh, the Antichrist is violating the, the covenant he made with Israel. And he's going to set himself up to be worshipped in the holy place. By smooth words he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many, yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. So there are going to be some folks there that are faithful to the Lord. And they're going to stand up with courage and perseverance, and they're going to take action, and they're going to be imprisoned and killed. And that's what we're going to see as we continue in the book of Revelation. Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help, and many will join with them in hypocrisy. You can have a lot of folks who join in hypocrisy. Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time, because it is still to come at the appointed time. Verse 7, it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over the tribe, over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. So here's where we have the parallel to what we have just been reading. It was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Now, ultimately it has to be God that's permitting this. So we have a situation where God says, well, we're going to let the beast do what he wants to do. He wants to war against the saints, and we're going to let him do that. And moreover, he's going to be successful. He's going to kill saints. He's going to imprison saints. Let's read it again. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Remember the two witnesses back in chapter 11? Chapter 11, two witnesses. Verse 7 of that chapter, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes out of, up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. So the two witnesses are going to be amongst those who are killed by the beast as he is killing, killing saints. God permits this authority. It's a universal authority. It's authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. That's just about every way you can say everybody. This is, this is a very strong statement of universal power. 
And so there, there wouldn't be much of any, where would, you, where would you travel to? Sometimes I hear people thinking, well now, I don't like the way things are going. I want to go somewhere else. Where are you going to go? But you've got a lot more chances here today than you'd have in this time because this time the beast is going to rule absolutely everything that there is. No escape, no place. There have been a lot of folks who would have liked to have had universal authority. Rome came pretty close, but it didn't have universal authority. Alexander the Great conquered a lot of territory. He didn't have universal authority. The Assyrians and the Babylonians took large, large territories, but uh, they didn't have China. They didn't have a lot of the territory. And so this is going to be maybe the only time in the history of the world where some world ruler gets authority over absolutely everything. And I'm sure that's going to appeal to some people. They're going to think, we, we can get rid of the problems we've had because a lot of our problems are one nation fighting against another nation. If we have just one government over the entire world, that'll take care of it. Isn't that kind of the direction of the thinking of the United Nations? Isn't that the philosophy? If we can just get all the people to get together and talk together. Hasn't worked out all that well. But they're not giving up on that idea. And uh, it's, it's going to come up. Overcome. Uh, it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. The word overcome is nikao. I only mention that because you might recognize Nike. Or Nike. It's victory. So the idea of the name, brand name, is victory. <laughs> and overcome them is victory. It's ironic to speak of the beast's victory in the light of the fact that the ones who are really going to be victorious are the saints. I have a little pet peeve. It's not important. I might be watching a couple of people playing a game Somebody come up and say, who's winning? I don't know who's winning. I can tell you who's ahead. But until somebody has won, I can't tell you who's winning. And I think of that in this context here. They're going to have the victory. Well, except at the end. Not at the end. They're not going to have the victory. The saints will have the victory then. Verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. John has shifted his viewpoint. He has been speaking in the past tense. He's been telling us, I saw this, I saw that, past tense. Now he moves into the future. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. So he's gone from thinking about the image he saw to what is going to happen. Everybody on earth is going to worship. If you think you're in a minority now, just think what it'll be like for the saints in the tribulation period they will be in a minority where there is just one government over the entire world and uh, no appeal to be made. God's going to give them some advice here in just a little bit. Whose name has not been written. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. So all these people who worship the beast have an exception. There's an exception to all these people. There are some people whose name has been written from the foundation of the world in the Lamb's Book of Life, and those people will not worship the beast. It's a perfect tense. 
It's action taking place in the past, having continuing results. In the past, before we knew anything about it, the name was written down. Name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life in the past. But that still has present continuation, action, effectiveness. And they are still written in, and they will continue written in forever, never to be removed. But they, they, these that are worshiping the beast are these, those whose names were not written. And they continue in that condition. Back in the past, their name was not written. And that continues, perfect tense. Personal pronoun here. Did you see that? All who dwell on the earth will worship. What's the next word? Him. We'll worship him. And what does that word tell us? The beast is a male. Male and a man and a person. He's a person. It's not just an evil influence. And we went through that before. We, we drew that conclusion. But uh, here's part of the reason we do, drew that conclusion. The uh, suggestion that he's something other than a person is uh, not accurate. And then the final thing here, who dwell on the earth. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. And we see that phrase, all who dwell on the earth. And if we're just reading through the book of Revelation, we may not realize that we're looking at a technical phrase. Every time that appears in the book of Revelation, it's talking about unsaved people. It's talking about the wicked when it says they who dwell on the earth. All who dwell on the earth. You look at that and you say, well, it's talking about, you know, just absolutely everybody that's there. But it's not. It's talking about all who are dependent upon that and they have nothing beyond that. They have no life beyond that. All who dwell on the earth. And that's always unsaved people. If you have an ear, listen up. Revelation 13, 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. So the first part is pretty easy. If the Lord's opened your ear, you're going to be able to hear. You need to listen up. The Lord's opened up your ear. Is this here what was written before? Or what's written after? If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Is this talking about the verses that went before? Or is this, listen up to what is said in verse 10. The phrase was written to each of the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. He that has an ear, let him hear. Uh, there it mentioned the churches every time. Here it does not mention the church. Because the church hasn't been here since chapter 4. We haven't had anything about the church in Revelation chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and now in 13. Nothing about the church. 2 and 3, everything about the church. Hasn't been anything about the church since then. So this is consistent with the church not being left to experience this. There are saints here. They've been saved after the church was raptured. But they are not the church. Of course, this was written to the churches in chapters 2 and 3. And it was addressed to the saints. A similar phrase about hearing is in Matthew 13, verses 8 and 9. And others fell on good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Well, it gets down to the good soil. And the good soil is those who are saved. 
And right afterwards it says, He who has ears, let him hear. Matthew 13, 43, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Talking about the righteous. They're going to shine forth. He who has near, let him hear. Addressed to the saints. Why do the saints have an ear and other people don't? Spirit. The Spirit, right. Holy Spirit enlightens us. When we are saved, we get something we never had before. Amen. An understanding of spiritual things. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Amen. And so, you get an ear when you get saved. He who has an ear the is the people who have been saved, and now they have ears, and now let them hear. Here it is. So verse 10 is a fitting message for the saints. It's a word of direction for future saints. It's written way back when, but it is looking forward to some folks who are going to be living on the earth in these terribly, terribly difficult times. And at this time, God says, you who are Christian, you who have ears, rest of them don't, but you who have ears, you hear what the Spirit's saying. Now, what's the message? If you're destined for captivity, you well go into captivity. Well, <laughs> that's not the message I wanted to hear. I wanted a message that said, if, if there's going to be some captivity, we won't be them. But you see, the character of this time is, it's given over to the authority of the beast, the dragon and the beast, they're in control. And to the saints in this circumstance, God writes, the one who is destined for captivity is going to go into captivity. Just face up to it. This is what's going to happen. You might as well get ready for it. And the one who is destined for the sword is going to be killed, killed by the sword. And you won't be delivered. And this, the, Satan is going to get to do what he wants to do. And if you're destined for the sword, you might as well make up your mind to live with it. Because that's what's going to happen. There will not be a deliverance. And it says, this is the perseverance of the saints. What does that mean? This is the perseverance of the saints. What does it mean to persevere? Hang in there. <laughs> Hang in there. And what are the saints going to persevere in? These bad times. <laughs> yeah, hanging in there. You know, you, you don't have the mark of the beast. You're not going to be able to buy and sell. What are you going to do? You're going to take the mark? Not going to take the mark. What are you going to do? Die. You're going to persevere, and you're going to die. Yeah. Yeah. This is the perseverance of the saints. One mark of a genuine saint is perseverance. If you're real, you will persevere. If you used to be saved and you're not saved now, you're imagining things. That does not exist. The saints persevere. Even in the great tribulation, saints will persevere. The beast will be able to throw in prison people he wants to throw in prison. The beast will be able to kill people he wants to kill. And the saints, through faith, will
Thank you.